Yes, now this uh, this is Rich Tower joining us from California, where we we hope you can see a little bit of the sky overhead. I don't I don't know if that's true where you are or not, uh, but Rich chairs our endowment committee and and is just a tremendous part of everything we do at the center. So so Rich, thanks for joining us to introduce our next presenter here. Sure. Well, I'm uh, pleased to uh, introduce uh, Daryl Bond. And uh, Daryl was uh, born in uh, New Zealand and has been photographing uh, trains since he was, as he says, 11 years old. Um, he worked for an American uh, software company, so uh, went all over the world. And what I've seen of his uh, work, uh, he certainly must have had his camera with him. Um, and uh, he's now returned to New Zealand. And uh, Daryl, I assume that's where you are now, and you've just had breakfast. Yes, it is indeed. Early morning. All right. And uh, Daryl is also uh, restoring a uh, DG class English electric uh, diesel locomotive, and uh, says he will have it um, uh, fully restored sometime this century. Yeah, maybe even next week. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Daryl's presentation will uh, share some of his uh, favorite images as a background to the events and influences that have shaped his journey through railroad photography over the past four decades. Um, he's showing a diverse range of styles and subjects uh, from adventures around the world, while also attempting to explain how to overcome the challenges of photographing uh, trains in a country whose indigenous Maori name translates to land of the long white cloud. And I hope our California smoke hasn't made it down your way because it'll be now the land of the long brown cloud. Anyway, True. Carol, over to you. Thank you, Rich. Okay, is this coming through okay for everybody? Um, Look, it sounds great on my end, Daryl. Fantastic. We are at the uh, terminus of a fairly rickety narrow gauge uh, branch line of the internet down here. So uh, I'm glad it's going through okay. So far, so good. Okay. So most people will probably have heard of New Zealand, but uh, many may place to may struggle to place it on a map. So uh, this is where we are. Uh, just to clear things up, we're not near England. Uh, we're not part of Australia, um, but are located uh, down here rather inconveniently a long way from, uh, well, anywhere really. Uh, the country is fairly well known for its uh, sheep, for its rugby, uh, for the scenery, and also for the native uh, flora and fauna, the hobbits, the orcs, the wizards and the like. But uh, as you'll see shortly, uh, we also have uh, a few trains as well. So I'm going to start with a few random pictures from New Zealand and other places around the world. Uh, while I give a big thanks uh, to Scott and to Haley, and oh, why is this not doing anything? Uh, around the world, while I give a big thanks to Scott Haley and the gang for putting this all together. Uh, I've been fortunate to attend uh, eight conversations conferences uh, in Lake Forest, um, which have been interesting, inspirational and eye opening for me. And these virtual sessions are such a great way to keep the conversations rolling, even if unfortunately we can't do it in person at the moment during these difficult times. Uh, thank you also to the other presenters for sharing their stunning pictures and their stories. Uh, this has been a really special event, and I've enjoyed every minute of it until now. So, where to begin? I'm neither a photographer nor a railroader, but I've been fascinated by rail photography for more than 40 years. And as such, it was a difficult decision as to what to show you today, especially given that this is Conversations, where I've been fortunate to meet many legendary, and I don't use that word lightly, photographers who have presented over the years. There's a certain quote from Wayne's World that keeps popping into my mind. So should I present some favorites, a life's portfolio, or narrow that down to a selection of pretty pictures from certain regions or certain countries, or perhaps present a documentary about a certain line, a type of railway equipment, operation or experience. I could focus on a favorite photographic technique or describe how I took some key pictures, but since this is a rail photography and art forum, and at these events, I've always found it more interesting to hear people talk about the photography and the art side of the railway rather than the trains themselves. And why did they compose that unusual picture in a particular way? What took them towards a certain style? How has their art evolved? What influenced that? And what's going on inside the presenter's head? 
Unfortunately, that's not going to work here because there's not much going on inside my head and especially not at this time in the morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that have changed the way that I've approached railway photography over the years. And I'm going to do that to a backdrop of uh, photos that I've taken during this time. So I think I might try something different. I should apologize here for my New Zealand accent, which is basically English, but uh, we don't have any vowels and it's spoken in a sort of a rapid mumble. So I hope you all appreciate this, uh, the uh, subtitles that we've included here. Anticipation. I seem to be getting ahead of myself. For when I was 11, I started taking occasional snapshots using an old 35 millimeter camera that my mother owned. The Braun pack set was gorgeous with its chrome details and leather case. In, in what I consider a terrible design oversight, the only control it possessed was a shutter button. There was no way to set aperture or shutter speed, and because its fixed lens was completely fixed, you couldn't even focus it. But armed with this technology, my early, I think the CRPA would refer to it as a uh, body of work, included the following classics. This is a faceless from 1981. Now this wasn't an SLR camera and I swear the viewfinder was pointing in a different direction to the lens. Uh, here is a finger over lens. Uh, timing is everything. And images from my critically acclaimed anticipation series where the train was always way off in the distance because I was always worried that the train would scoot off the frame before I pushed the shutter button. Anticipation. We'll come back to this word a little bit later. Now, almost all of these pictures ended up in the local landfill, but I was smitten with a newfound ability to uh, freeze not just a view, but an entire memory that I could relive later. And this hasn't left me to this day. And about this time, New Zealand lost the last of its semaphore signals, its mechanical signal boxes, and its first generations of diesels. Manned country stations and the last of the rural branch lines went by the wayside as deregulation and then privatisation of the state railway ended a fading golden era of rail in New Zealand, when quite different customers meant quite different things to the people running quite a different railway to that which survives today. And this all vanished in front of my eyes and I have almost no photographic record of it. Most facets of the railway hobby, photography, preservation, modelling, they're an expression of loss, of mourning for what was and what could have been, a reaction against change, a yearning for the good old days. Now I realized far too late that with the passage of time, even the awful pictures of mundane sights taken today become golden memories of tomorrow. Believe me, in 30 years time, youthful enthusiasts will be cursing that they missed the good old days when wide body GEs, class 66s and Bombardier tracks locomotives roamed the world's rails, now gone and replaced with something even uglier and even more boring. And I know this because every generation of railway enthusiasts I have met sings the same song. So my first lesson learned was clear. Get out and photograph it today, for it will be gone tomorrow. Criticality. So I began to notice why most of my pictures went to the trash can and what I liked and those that survived. And eventually I got myself a proper SLR camera with a lens that could actually be focused. And I started to pay more attention to the weather, the sun angles and the camera settings. After all, if you're going to go to the effort and expense of going out and taking a picture, it might as well be a keeper. I'm sometimes asked by younger enthusiasts how to take a good picture. And my answer is, don't take so many bad ones. This was the second lesson that I learned. If the train is filthy or the sun is high or you're just not in the mood, put away the camera for there will be another train tomorrow. I became obsessed with chasing those often elevated scenic wedgies and good front and side lights that an English friend derisively calls calendar shots. But right from the early days, and especially with mum's old camera, I would often be off trying something different and we'll get back to why later. So I was finally starting to take reasonable train pictures in New Zealand, but I moved to Australia in 1996 to put a stop to all of that. 
Now, it's natural to like what you're familiar with and to be less interested in that which, with which you aren't, uh, but it always amazes me how a US enthusiast might passionately love CSX but hate Union Pacific or Norfolk and Southern. Yet in North, in North America, almost all the modern freight locomotives are exactly the same shape, just painted in different colours. So a move to Sydney, Australia. Well, the big EMD built 90 class locos up on the coal uh, railway lines looked like a proper engine should, but the stunted little alcos with their big chimneys looked silly out in the wild and chugging underneath Sydney's electrified tracks. And most of their other locos looked like blue boxes on wheels to me. It took a year in Australia before I began to understand that beyond the superficial look of the rolling stock, if you're moderately serious about railway photography and curious about it, it really doesn't matter what shape or colour the trains are, there's beauty to be found everywhere. And in Australia there are gum trees, long trains, old and varied motive power and all sorts of different paint schemes, some wonderful old railway stations and lovely golden sunset glint light. It all made a captivating stage to catch the trains on, and eventually even the trains grew on me. The highlight of my time here there was chasing this grain empty, hauled by three of the little 900 horsepower 48 class Alco uh, powered locos in search of the famous Ardglen bankers, which are helper locomotives that are attached to the back of the train uh, to push it up to the Ardglen tunnel. Now I didn't know exactly where this location was, so I was just following the railway towards the hills. And as the sun was getting low, the train coasted right into the tunnel with no bankers to be seen. Well, maybe they didn't run the bankers anymore. But since I'd driven for hours, I figured I might as well go over the hill for perhaps one last shot. And there was the empty train, crossing this loaded grain train, led by four of the little 48-class Alcos with three big 3,000-horsepower Alco bankers on the back. I was in heaven. It took off with a hiss and a roar. Uh, the train went through the tunnel and then it crossed five more of the little Alcos on the next empty train on the way back. 15 snarling Alcos in 15 minutes was an experience imprinted into my brain forever. I truly, truly banished my railway xenophobia. If you are so afflicted, I hope that today's presenters have shown that there are some fabulous sights to be seen abroad. But I digress again. In 2004, I said goodbye to uh, changing film in the car, uh, steering with my knees, uh, and I traded all this in for the instant feedback and the opportunity to experiment with digital cameras. And a few months later, I managed to see another new world, steam in China. Now this might seem like blasphemy, but I'd never been the least bit interested in steam locomotives before. I grew up too late to see steam for real in New Zealand, and while I'd seen polished up Mickey Mouse steamers with brass boiler bands and funny paint schemes in museums, they didn't match what I saw in the old pictures. They just didn't seem real to me. Now I remember seeing one or two pictures of Jingpeng Pass in Trains magazine around the turn of the millennium, thinking, well that's something I should see one day. And a year later I was making the odd trip to China for work. And in late 2004, with diesels coming on the scene, it was now or never. I caught up with the tour group for a few days and finally got to see steam in its native habitat. Alive, breathing, dirty and working hard on the main line. At a steelworks, coal mines and on lines snaking up into remote villages. It was another awakening and I ended up going back to China nine times. Now as someone new to steam trains, the magic of my, well at the time it was the state of the art digital camera, uh, it encouraged me to use light to bring the smoke to life and to capture the essence of a landscape undergoing a massive transformation from rural subsistence economy to the industrial powerhouse that it is today. It also opened my eyes to humanity. If you think you're having a bad day at work, spare a thought for the 80-year-old woman scavenging through locomotive ash for unburnt coal which she'll lug up a hole, uh, lug up the hill in freezing wind to her house, with its plastic bag double glazing. Outside, a procession of coal trucks stir up a foot-thick coating of mud, dust and coal, outside the front door that coats everything in a shade of grey. That's a tough life that most Westerners can't even imagine, but she will always give you a smile. 
My train chasing in China helped me better understand the meanings of life, death, wealth, misery, and happiness. As well as being trips of personal and photographic growth, they also provided bucket loads of camaraderie, new field, friends, new sites, and new experiences. For example, there will be many people listening who also went to China and have experienced the involuntary puckering of the buttocks that occurs when other cars challenge the one centimetre force field that surrounds a Chinese taxi, while, tra while as it weaves uh, at light speed between cars, trucks, and donkey carts. At night, while travelling in the wrong direction on the wrong side of a multi-lane divided freeway. I can only assume that the practical driving tests in rural China at the time consisted of the prospective driver being invited to enter the vehicle, start the engine, and display their proficiency at pounding the horn vigorously. We rode the trains, we rode the locos. We sang karaoke with the crews in remote towns. I played badminton in sub-zero conditions. We had run-ins with the police, we laughed with the locals. We got frostbite on our noses. We climbed their blast furnaces. We really had the time of our lives. The following is an excerpt from an email that I sent home while visiting a well-known smoggy coal mining town with an English friend. Our last stop was Pingding Shan. There is so much coal dust in the air here that I expect the locals sit around their open fireplaces in the evenings and just light the air in them. What had started as a leisurely four-hour trip in a tiny van descended into a long, tedious slog in the dark when mechanical problems stopped us on the motorway about three hours in. It seems the accelerator cable had snapped somewhere between the pedal and the engine, which was underneath the front seats. So within a few minutes, the ever-resourceful driver had removed a small floor panel to gain access to the cable. And then we were actually able to resume at a reasonable pace with our guide changing gears on the manual transmission as the driver steered with his left hand and pulled the accelerator cable using a pair of pliers held in his right hand for two and a half hours. Ouch. I expect he's not been able to use a Rubik's cube since. And then, just like New Zealand signal boxes and the early diesels 20 years earlier, the steam was all gone. Well, it's almost all gone, but at least this time I managed to take a few pictures. Uh, Scott might recognize this uh, location. It's a favorite memory of mine from Lachine on the fav favorite uh, Huanan line. This was taken at minus 36 degrees Celsius uh, just before sunrise. Did you, spend the, did you spend the night in the station while you were there? We did, yes. We walked the eight kilometres up the track with our, all our gear. Uh, we stayed in the little track maintainer's hut there in the middle. I called that the Lachine Hilton. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and in between taking the flash pictures in the middle of the night, we stepped on the, uh, the concrete uh, kangs, I called, the six-person wide communal concrete bed with the fire underneath it. <laughs> uh, magnificent. No running water except that taken from the boilers of passing steam locomotives. There were uh, very uh, dubious cooking facilities, uh, even more dubious toiletry facilities. Um, yeah, just a trickle of electricity to, to recharge the batteries. It was, uh, it was really good fun. Talk about hardship. I even had to walk my bottle of wine in with, my, uh, with me on my camera bag. Um, as with everything in rail fanning, the old, uh, oh, I wish I'd been born five years earlier. Well, I was late to the China party, but I'm so glad to have seen what I did when I did. It, uh, it changed my world. And then I began to notice that when I was in China, I took quite different pictures to those that I took when I was in New Zealand, which were quite different to those that I would take when I was in the Western US. Why was this? It seems that I was subconsciously trying to bottle the essence of these places, these experiences, into the images. And this helps me relive those experiences later. Flicking through these pictures takes me back to what seems like another, another chapter in my life, or even in somebody else's life. But then upon seeing them, the sights, the sounds, the smells, even the taste of the air all come rushing back. Now I fell in love with the Western US upon my first visit there in 1998. And while there are the superb historic lines, I'm actually more taken by the steel super speedway that is the modern railroad the super freighters to American industry. 
I love the wide open deserts, the ragged mountains, and the way that you can bend the long and wildly colourful trains into interesting shapes. And in all weathers. And the tapestry of course is overlaid with the hokey historic charms of Route 66, the lands of cowboys and explorers, and the sad remnants of once proud American Indian lands. And for something completely different, Eritrea is a place that I would have struggled to spell, let alone place on a North African map. And it's camel markets where a time warp back thousands of years through history, with the railway playing second fiddle on this trip. It clings to a mountainside winding its way up from the Ottoman era Red Sea port of Misawa, which was bombed out during the Civil War. And it, it climbs all the way up the mountains through tunnels and across bridges to the cool Art Deco colonial Italian capital of Asmara in the highlands. I don't know why people in living, living in countries like this, with faltering economies under oppressive regimes, such as here and in Zimbabwe, have smiles that are bigger than you see anywhere else. In the damp greens of Ireland, where my wife is from, I find it surprisingly difficult to capture trains on the dozens of visits that we have made there. But from Dublin, it's very easy to hop onto the continent. The farms, small villages, castles, rivers, and vineyards of France and Germany are crisscrossed by modern railway systems. And a favorite spot where all of these classic elements come together is here on both sides of the Rhine Valley. Good food, good wine, and trains on both sides of a winding river filled with boats. Does it get better than this? And then in the dark recesses of the country, older beasties lurk. I loved the windmills, tulips, and waterways of Holland when we lived there, and took a few excursions in an, in an attempt to capture them in all their moods. Usually I was thwarted by the, the weather or by having somehow upset the train gods who exact their revenge by sending three trains for you in the wrong direction. Or no trains. No trains for you. Uh, in England, there's more transition as the classic 1970s high-speed trains and the last of the old school loco hauled passenger services are replaced with new stock. The ever-changing hues of the brightly painted trains roll through fading infrastructure dating from Victorian times. Even the London underground is filled with character. Brick stations, signal boxes and bridges are encrusted in history. One of the last big holdouts of semaphore signals was here at Barnetley, a scene that has unfortunately uh, changed dramatically in recent years, uh, and another reason that uh, India will be on my list. But the scenery of Europe isn't all completely flat. And uh, of course, the Alps provide a convenient divide between the poverty of some of the rural towns in the east, such as this Romanian forest valley, and the wealthy Western European countries. I fell back in love with Switzerland about six years ago when I finally made the effort to see the old Gothard Pass route. Like many enthusiasts, I enjoyed staying at Vassen, walking the hills where the track climbs back and forth on three levels through the small town. And the scenery was amazing. I fell briefly in love with the pass but after three visits, this winding route with its spirals and, and crazy track was bypassed by the new almost 60 kilometre long or 35 mile long base tunnel underneath the Alps. And now it only sees an occasional railcar service. Well, that was a shame. But then there were the charms of the Loschberg route, uh, of the various lakes that uh, are all over Switzerland. Uh, the Jungfrau Railway, which runs up the inside of a mountain line. Did you not? Uh, the Ration Railway is one of my favourites. Uh, I really enjoy visiting this place. Uh, it's an incredible metre gauge system that hosts the Glacier and Bernina, Bernina Expresses, with plenty of uh, electric loco hauled services, freight, reg regular heritage runs, open air passenger cars, and 60 year old loco still in service. It's really wonderful. And the scenery is obviously stunning. Everywhere you turn in Switzerland, it seems that there is some obscure line or rack railway 
or cable car or bus, running up an unknown valley into a small town that seems to be clinging onto the mountainside. I may have mentioned the scenery, but there is, as you can gather, an incredible variety in the companies that run the railways, many different liveries, multiple gauges, rack railways of all sizes and shapes. The latest Vectron electric locos pass 50 or 60 year old engines on passenger trains. With a well-integrated public transport network and a maze of walking tracks around the country, getting around is really easy by foot. Sure, as with many places in the world, sometimes the weather is an issue. But did I mention the scenery? Now we saw some of these trams in Rolf's presentation. Um, but I'd wanted to go to Lisbon to see the historic trams for years. And the first weekend that we went there, it was raining. At first I was disappointed, but I took my camera out for a walk after dinner one night and the tall, tightly packed buildings, the trams and the cobbled streets all seemed like a film noir set, begging to be captured in black and white. The rain reflected off a city stuck in the past, a city that has suffered its share of trials and tribulations with earthquakes, decades of repression and economic hard times taking their toll. The Fado music, Vino Verde wine, wonderful food, the architecture, the walks and the views blow us away every time we visit. And for a few hours each night before or after dinner, I'll sneak out and see the trams. These are genuinely old tram bodies, although looks can be deceiving. They were built in the 30s to a brill design but the survivors were retrofitted with new chassis, motors, brakes, and electrical gear in the mid 90s. Yes, it's a bright and colorful city to visit, but for me, I keep coming back to that look that I remember from my very first night there, that black and white essence of my first experience in Lisbon. I made my first trip to Latin America on a steam tour last year as I'd always wanted to see Argentina's La Trichita, the old Patagonian Express, which was great, and we got some neat shots. Uh, but I almost enjoyed my side trip to Chile better. Partially, this is because I always find it more of an adventure doing these things on your own. You can get up early, you can stay up late. You can go where you want, whenever you want. And you're not getting in the way of other people's photos if you want to stand somewhere other than the photo line. The one downside was getting my truck stuck in, uh, in pumice gravel for about four hours, but such is life. The old locos sound incredible, working hard at high altitudes, and even the new ones were fun to photograph. But the scenery and the light was out of this world. The big wide open spaces, uh, the salt flats, the volcanoes, the colours, the peace and serenity. Magnificent. You're a very small part of a big world in Chile. And this lovely ser serene feeling uh, broken only occasionally by the howl of old motors fighting gravity. A very enjoyable experience. Hopefully we'll get to go back there one day. So I should suppose I should show you some pictures from New Zealand. Um, <laughs> As you can see, uh, the place is called the land of the long white cloud. The weather can be challenging, as many places can be. Uh, you'd have to be mad to come here, I suppose, but it can be very rewarding. I always suggest to people that you come for more than two weeks because uh, you just never know what you're going to find when you come here. I don't really intend this to be a, a rail fan primer for coming to New Zealand, but here are a few places that I think are, are worth a look. Um, New Zealand comprises uh, two islands, uh, the imaginatively named North Island and the, the South Island, another little one down the bottom there. Uh, the green lines are the open railways um, as I am speaking, uh, and the little yellow uh, heat map areas are probably the biggest bits, the busiest bits. The other uh, red branch lines are primarily uh, closed a long time ago, or um, a few of them are mothball and are being rebuilt. A couple of areas that are, I, I suggest that people go to, 
around the city of Tauranga, there are, uh, there are two ports there, a lot of uh, container traffic. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, uh, log trains that run around and pulp and paper trains as well. Uh, so there's quite a lot going on there. It's also a very pretty city. Uh, it's by the, by the ocean. Uh, there's plenty of water around, a lot of bays and inlets, uh, and it's a nice place to visit. Uh, the only downside is that almost all of the, New Z uh, the North Islanders now run uh, by these uh, DL class uh, Chinese built um, uh, diesel electrics, which are um, perhaps not the most photogenic, not the most interesting locomotive to look after. In the middle of the North Island, uh, the North Island main trunk um, is well known for all its viaducts. I haven't really been up here for, for long, so these are pretty old pictures, but there are a lot of concrete and steel viaducts. There is a volcanic plateau, so there are uh, active volcanoes here in the middle of the North Island. Um, and the line is electrified, so a lot of the trains are hauled by these um, brush electric locomotives, which were the forerunner for the channel tunnel freight locomotives. Um, they've had their ups and downs, but they're being rebuilt, and uh, the other diesel haul trains are uh, all run by the, the Chinese DL class, except for passenger trains. Now, the South Island, which is where I live, and it's obviously the fun stuff. Uh, the main North Line, which is an unusual name for a line that's uh, really in the middle of the South Island, uh, but the main North, North Line between Christchurch and Picton uh, is really quite spectacular. And there are about two hours north and two hours south of Kaikoura, uh, where the line runs between the mountains and the sea. Uh, and for a lot of the route, it's parallel by the road. Everything's just scrunched in here. Uh, it's a lovely scenic line. Um, I find it just uh, quite spectacular with the mountains, uh, especially in winter. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, trains on the line at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, you might have heard of the Kaikoura earthquake. Uh, and indeed, if you look at this picture where the beach line is, uh, on top of the cab of the second engine there, the yellow cab, you can see that beach line. And if we look at the, the current scene, uh, you can see that current beach above those uh, four white uh, tank containers there. And you can see that the um, the land was actually lifted four to six meters in this place. So the sea has basically receded an awful long way out and the landscapes changed quite dramatically. The railway was damaged in 750 places. Um, there were a lot of bridges and tunnels that needed to be rebuilt. Uh, there were a lot of landslips and uh, there's still work that's going on both on the road and the railway. So traversing the route by car is not bad, but um, there's still quite a lot of work sites that are going on. Indeed, uh, the two locomotives that are pictured in this shot uh, were actually trapped here between uh, two big landslips, and they stayed for uh, about nine months until they were finally able to be rescued. Uh, this is one example of a nice old photo scene. Uh, you can see the road there and the railway and the sea. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, because of the uplift, a lot of the road has been rebuilt and relocated out on the seaward side, which is uh, considerably less photogenic than it used to be. Uh, in the middle of the South Island, there is a coal railway called the Midland Line, which is one of my favourite places. Uh, I used to come back to New Zealand all the time and take pictures here. Uh, it's famous for uh, coal, obviously, but there's also a well-known passenger train called the Transalpine, which runs from the east coast to the west coast and then back again all within one day. Uh, it's quite a spectacular trip. Uh, these are the new carriages with the, the white coloured ones. And they have these nice viewing platform cars on all of the long distance trains in New Zealand, uh, which make it uh, a neat way to experience it uh, and uh, take some nice photos outside uh, in the open air. Uh, the Midland line starts on a pretty flat area and it goes into that uh, deep gorge. There's a lot of tunnels and uh, there are also some pretty big viaducts on the line as well, about uh, five viaducts on the line, decent sized things. This is Broken River. And this is the uh, nicely named Staircase Viaduct, um, which is another place. Uh, this, this happens to be miles and miles and miles from the road, as you might have gathered. Uh, then things open up uh, to the Waimakariri River Gorge. Um, at the, at right in the middle of the line, there is a very steep section through a tunnel that's five miles long. It used to be electrified, but now they attach banker engines to the front of the trains. Uh, and that can be quite a spectacular uh, sight as you see these things take off up the 
one and 33 grade or 3% grade. The west coast, once you get over the west side, it's more uh, tropical rainforest and it's uh, a different look completely. So it's quite a varied scene. There used to be a lot of these uh, neat old wooden bridges around, uh, but they're all being replaced. That one's now gone. Um, so I'm trying to get as many pictures of them as I can. They're not quite as spectacular as that anymore, unfortunately. Um, this is a section that most New Zealand rail fans probably don't pay too much attention to because I live right here. I find it quite uh, special. This is my town, uh, well known for its Victorian heritage and its uh, steam punkiness and its penguins. Uh, we're overlooking the water here. Just to the south, there are market gardens and farms and all that good stuff. But pretty soon the railway starts climbing and there are quite a few little climbs that it has to go up. They're not particularly onerous, but they add a lot of interest to the line. And there's also quite a lot of coastal running as the train heads south. Uh, there's a, a nice little spot here that's only a couple of miles long uh, where it runs between the coast, between Kartiki and uh, a place called Chag Point. You're probably laughing if you've seen the uh, Austin Powers movies. Um, there's a nice little coastal stretch here with a lot of different angles. And one of the nice things about all of the South Island lines is that at the moment it's all General Electric and EMD power. Uh, the average age of our locomotives down here is 47 years, so they still sound good and uh, occasionally smoke it up a little bit. Uh, and uh, it's a place that I've really enjoyed now that I, uh, I'm living here. All right, so that's New Zealand. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, I do enjoy the thrill of trying to capture the essence of places so that I can relive them later. And for New Zealand, to me, it's the coastlines, uh, the mountains, the bush, and the wildness of the place. So, back on track. Something different. So, um, I guess if I go somewhere new, um, there's usually one or two shots that I want to get if I go somewhere. It might be the Simingi Viaduct and Jingping Pass or Wattinger Curve on the Gotthard route or Tunnel Line at Tehachapi. But once those are in the bag, it's time to look for something a little bit different. And I like to take pictures that I've not seen before. Uh, and this dates back to those years when I had my mother's uh, stunted camera. I occasionally accompanied locals back in that, that time who took quite good train pictures. But it wasn't long before I started to strike out from the herd and look for something different, and it was really a defense mechanism. For when we all stood in the same spot, unsurprisingly, our pictures turned out all exactly the same, except theirs were all so much better than mine because they not only had cameras that could focus, but they also had buttons and levers and skills and things that enabled them to take sharp and properly exposed pictures. This is a game I could never win. So if they stood over there, I might just see what things look like from over here. This straying from the pack like a lame runty dingo mite has been a common theme for me over the years. So I like big telephoto shots and I also like super wides that show the land that the trains inhabit. Sometimes I'll look around me and I'll realize that I need to go wider though and stick several images together to capture that really big picture view that shows off the landscape. Now, a crazy wide angle lens will often push your train off the stage to be a tiny dot on the horizon, uh, whereas some of these shots might be, you know, seven or nine 50 millimeter shots stitched together. And it allows a massive amount of detail to be retained and when it's blown up. Sometimes the, I just use a wide angle and, and stick two or three pictures together, but it pro pro provides a different look and I think it, uh, it just sort of encapsulates the landscape, which is something that I like to do. Uh, there's the shadows of myself and Mr. Peter B, who's probably not on the call, who lives down the road there that I bumped into on this hill. Uh, we're watching two trains on the uh, on the Gotthard Pass going through the town of Boston. There's uh, one on the left there, a DB train, the winner train, and then down on the middle level, down in the bottom right corner of that picture, you can just see the red and blue engines of an SBB train heading downhill. And then the third layer of track is down by the motorway interchange there. Uh, the shot down the bottom is uh, a mix of uh, ambient light and some flash um, in Fushin in China. So, if you can um, <clears throat> officially obtain them, uh, views from the cab provide different angles. And in this day of streamlined, automated, and often paranoid operations around the world, 
they provide a rare opportunity to interact with the people who are the lifeblood of any railway system. Sometimes the dreary tedium of cruising through the night or waiting at a remote location for a crew change in the rain reminds us that trains don't only operate through glamorous S curves in the summer sun like we see on railpictures.net, and that life on the rails is physically and mentally tough and often dirty work undertaken at all hours and in all weathers. Although on most days, a loco cab seems like the best little office in the world. Bliss. I'm also very lucky that I have very long arms. Now this might look like a, a second class way to travel on an inspection vehicle. But this is first class. This is Rovos Rail in Africa, uh, a spectacularly luxurious train. But the highlight of that trip for me was three or four hours in the cab of the uh, elderly GEs as we lifted the train out of Vindhoek in Namibia. Fortunately for me, the train stalled going out of town, and we probably spent about 40 minutes going about 100 metres until we got to the summit. Um, the uh, second man took over manual control of the second engine and we had a lot of fun. <laughs> it was quite neat just walking along this, uh, beside the train and standing all over it taking pictures and all I could really contribute was saying, yep, the wheels are still going around, 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 around really quickly. A really enjoyable trip. And then seeing all the wild, wild animals afterwards uh, once we got moving was a thrill as well. So one of the early things that struck me about train photography was that a bit of elevation is often nice in a picture. Sometimes that means climbing a building. Sometimes that means climbing a big hill. But even in the flatlands, it's amazing what an extra meter or two can get you. So sometimes I take my ladder out for a drive. A few European friends are into pole cams. I've looked into their $3,000 carbon fiber remote controlled setups. This is my $15 telescoping window washing brush with a tripod head on the top of it, clamped to a tripod so it doesn't fall over. But sometimes that isn't enough and you need to get a little bit higher. So for the last dozen years, I've taken quite a lot of sorties of aerial photography in helicopters. These big metal drones operate in all weathers, have almost unlimited battery life, and will take a variety of high quality focal lengths into all manner of inaccessible spots and vantage points. It's not cheap, but if you can come back with 20 or 30 or 50 unique pictures in an hour or two, it would take me a year's worth of petrol to do that by car, plus anti-terrorist passing vouchers, and I'd still be lacking the height advantage. And in some spots like New Zealand's Midland Line, places are so remote that a helicopter enables you to explore and photograph the inaccessible sections and take angles that couldn't be had any other way, even by drone. Drones. Are they a scourge or are they a curse? Or are they just a blasted nuisance? After investigating them for seven years, I finally put the, put the bullet and bought a drone late last year. And it's been another transformative moment for me. I suddenly have a mobile hill that lets me stand in new places, see new sights and capture new scenes. None of those pictures were taken with a drone. But while you're in a helicopter or even with your drone, it's very tempting to go way up in the sky and snap away at what's below. But then often all your pictures start to look like everybody else's eye of God, obviously taken from a drone or a helicopter pictures. So I find myself taking the same pictures that I would take from the side of a hill, trains and scenery at interesting angles or an interesting light. This is actually a drone picture, but this is a helicopter picture. It's just the sort of picture that I would take if I was standing on that hillside. It's just that I can move around and I can go up and down and luckily a friend of mine has a helicopter. I generally try to avoid the eye of God look, but sometimes the train gods have a pretty good view. So those steam trains in China taught me a lot about light. Sometimes a scene that appeared a little flat with over-the-shoulder calendar shot lighting would come alive with the steam and smoke slightly backlit or even shot against the sun. This was a novelty for me. 
but this can work with diesels too. Sometimes you can bring out scenery textures in the exhaust of a hard-working train. And then there are those shadows. David Plowden once told me at a conversations forum that you need to watch out or you might trip over those shadows. But far from being feared, I often like that sense of drama as the train sneak from shadow into light and back again, and often with unusual effects. Sometimes a shadow can provide some interesting geometry to a shot. And often a sliver of action can be picked out between the darkness, as if the train was an actor passing across a spotlit stage, bathed in light briefly for you to snap. Sometimes a beam of light acts like flashes in a studio, where carefully placed lights pick out the highlights and lead the eye to the action, or highlighting the scene in an unusual way. Sometimes these shots are planned and tried many times before success, but often you just stumble across these views, and in a thrilling instant you grab for your camera and bottle the essence of what you are experiencing. Now, as I mentioned before, trains don't only run when the sun is shining from over your shoulder on a crisp blue rail picture's day. Most rail photographers pass, pass on the harsh and nasty high sun of midday, and I love the really low sun angles. Often the hour either side of sunrise and sunset will produce some of the most dramatic pictures. And as digital sensors and lenses have improved over the years, it's often fun trying to make the most of unusual lighting to take something that's just a little bit different. Around sunrise, around sunset, often in dusk light. Sometimes strange weather will help you make the most of those low light situations. This is a picture I tried to take about 30 times and it's the first time I've been moderately successful. And this is a time that I really enjoy watching trains. And in the past, you could never catch a moving train, but uh, the way that sensor technology has gone over the last five or 10 years, uh, I find it a real challenge. I find it really interesting trying to capture these uh, really low light scenes. It really captures a different mood for the railway. And then things get uh, really dark. So I began taking flash shots in 2006 uh, in China, uh, occasionally in the US, where the fear of being shot by the ever helpful railroad police was always in the back of my mind, uh, but mainly in New Zealand as part of my ongoing documentation of that Midland Line coal railway. I started with stationary trains and old school burning flash bulbs that were smuggled onto planes in my carry on camera bag but then progressed to more elaborate setups with wildly triggered studio flashes shooting moving trains. But I almost completely stopped taking flash lit pictures in 2013. There were a few spots and William Gill style ideas that I had my eye on for a long time, if I could ever get motivated to crack open the flashes again. But these days I tend to rely more on other sources of light. And an unusual one, is this third of a second handheld pan of a Amtrak Genesis as its hot shoe sparks on the, uh, the third rail pickup, making an impressive remote flash picture, which was snapped from a kilometre away on the top of an apartment block that we were staying in at the time. I tend to also take quite a lot of these sort of ambient night shots just using available light sources. Taking these very low light pictures using slow shutter speeds often imparts more movement and action into railway photography at night, and under more natural lighting than a flash provides. I'll make the use of the last glimmers of ambient light, a conveniently placed street or yard light, or even the moon for illumination. This is my hometown, my local railway crossing. I take quite a lot of pictures here. The challenge with these shots, of course, is to try to make a shot interesting and not too repetitive or gimmicky. This uh, Powder River Basin coal train is one of my favourites. I was following a train back to my motel the previous night when it passed this defect detector and a light literally went off. So this night, I managed to find a train to pace at just the right time 
and I snapped the set of matched clean locos lit by the last of the dusk light and the lights beside the detector. While driving, and while shooting out the passenger window, with a 70 to 200 I might add for bonus points. Kids don't try this at home. I also rather masochistically enjoy doing this sort of ambient stuff in the rain, where the light glistens off wet surfaces. And sometimes, these shots work without the train in the frame. Even if this was a more traditional time exposure when the train unexpectedly stopped just around the corner, its exhaust rolling forward on the breeze through the trees. I love to stumble upon geometrical aesthetics in a scene, the complex patterns of trackage and overhead in a yard, or perhaps the swirls of, curl, of curves, lines and shadows in a railway landscape. And this brings me to a point that I probably shouldn't make in such a company about the art of photography, and that is, I'm not sure I really understand it. After 40 years, I can say that I now get the technical stuff with the buttons and the levers. And I'm a reasonably smart guy, so I've rented library books on art and composition, but the theory side of photographic composition just doesn't resonate with me. Yes, I plan, I persist, I get up early and I stay up late. I compose, I anticipate, I time the moment, but basically, if I like it, I push the button. I'm trying to capture a memory for myself. And I've been to conferences like this in several countries where smart people will say that an image channels the style of a famous photographer or a painter, or that the contrasting juxtaposition of the positive and negative spaces reflects on their obvious sexual frustration. Well, yes, maybe that's exactly what was going on through the photographer's mind when they carefully composed that image. But I often wonder if they were just human like us and they thought, oh, a train, that's nice, quick. Maybe that famous picture that we all know is the one shot they didn't throw into the bin from the 10 rolls of film they shot that day. But then I come back to the fact and the fear that there's probably a whole dimension to railway photography that I'm completely missing, which is why I come to these conferences. But I do find patterns interesting. Patterns and in tracks, patterns in black and white tones, patterns in colour. And sometimes a minimal approach proves that less can be more as well. Now this is a picture I tried to take many times on various trips to Tehachapi, but eventually figured that it worked best with just the faintest hint of train in the scene, with the headlights glinting off the folded ribbons of rails. Which is similar to this more stark shot taken on the Transcon in New Mexico. Hey, wait a minute. This style of picture seems very familiar to me. Feels like I've taken it before. In fact, it takes me back almost 40 years. Anticipation. Because sometimes we end up going full circle and end up right back where we started. Thanks. Bravo, Daryl. Thank you. I don't know if you've been following the comments, but uh, they have been uh, plentiful and uh, and uh, quite uh, well complimentary. So. Thank you so much for sharing your work today. Thank you very much. Uh, we are still a little bit past time, so we'll uh, we'll head into our next presentation. Uh, but Daryl, if you're available to stick around after that, uh, we'd certainly be happy to take some questions then for anybody who has them. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Well, uh, phenomenal photography, and uh, we enjoyed your your wit and humor as well. Uh, it's a it's a much appreciated on all fronts. So thanks for thanks for that great journey through through your. Uh, your journeys in railroad photography.